you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Ruth 1, verses 16 and 17. I get all my stuff up here sorted out. Please, please stand. I finally remembered my reading glasses. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For wherever thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Pastor, would you bless the sermon this morning? Lord God, we're thankful for your word this morning. There's just so much contained in your word, and, and we're blessed that we can preach it, that we can hear it preached, and we can apply it to our lives. And I just pray that you would anoint John this morning as he brings forth this word, Lord, just... Uh, uh, let your spirit guide him and bring forth that which you will have us to hear. So bless this message, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. It is often said, incorrectly so, that Christianity is a religion of love, and that we follow a God of love, that this is the core tenet of our faith that the Creator God loved us so much, He was willing to die in our place for our sins, so we didn't need to. And that is the foundation upon which Christianity is built, I feel. Amen. Now, there is a problem with just the simple statement of Christianity is a religion of love, because that word means a lot of things. In Greek, there are, I believe, 12 different words that all translate to love. I know there's at least five, but... I five, 12. Beyond the, I, I more could less. be more. Math wasn't my best subject. Um, so I can say, I love cheeseburgers, and that's a very true statement. But I want to exactly come up here and preach about that. Although I suppose that's technically what I'm doing. The... Hi, Josh. The... Word I believe we want to use most when we describe Christianity as a religion of love was the Greek word agape, which in the King James Bible, at least in a very specific chapter, which we will be getting to much later on, is translated as charity instead of just love, which is interesting. Um, there is more... There is the specific kind of love that Christianity is based around, the love God had for us, and in turn the love we should have for God. But there needs to be two important aspects to Christianity, vertical love and horizontal love. We are called to more than just loving God. We are called to love one another as well. That's the horizontal love we are called yeah. to. True. Um, Jesus Christ himself said that the two greatest commandments in which you could summarize all the others is love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So this teaching is straight from the gospel. Jesus also said, no greater love hath man than to lay down his life for his friend, which I find to be an incredibly intriguing statement, not no greater love half man than to lay down his life for his wife or his parents or his children or even God. No, the greatest love we can have is just for a friend. The friends are the family you can choose, as is the general sentiment of this day and age we live in. Um, and thankfully, we have a very good 
real life parable as it was for the kind of love we are called to have. The book of Ruth, a common favorite of the Old Testament, um, as I looked it up and heard it described, a beautiful pastoral story considered a literary classic by critics, which is a very interesting way to describe a book of the Bible, but it fits. And in that vein, I have decided, and in the vein of other, another literary classic, I have titled today's sermon, Roof and Corinthians. All right, nobody, nobody got it. Whatever. Um, it was almost titled Roofless Love, because I was hoping that the term roofless, uh, which means no mercy, kind of had biblical origins, because roof is such a good example of love, that the lack of it, it's not, it's from Norse language, a Norse root word, so rather disappointingly, there's no connection there. Um, but regardless, I would still like to go back to the start of the Book of Ruth and take a look at this great literary classic. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. This should immediately raise warning flags. Moab historically did not do well with Israel. I had to look this up thanks to not um, recognizing them in Wednesday's Bible study. But Moab was a country that denied help to Israel during the Exodus when they were going to the Promised Land. And they were the ones, I believe, that tried to hire a prophet to go and curse Israel. These are not folk that are generally um, friendly with Israel. And it's very interesting that this man, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Um, it is later said in the book of Ruth that Elimelech had a post outside the city by the gates, and in traditional Israelite culture, that's where the wise men of the city sat. Um, way back in the book of Exodus, when Moses appointed other judges so he didn't have to decide every single case himself. So a post by the city would mean that this was a very wise um, religious man who knew the law well and was someone people would go to for judgment. So the fact that he has decided to up and leave Israel in time of famine and go to Moab of all places is a very interesting choice. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. This should have ended horribly and been the end of the story. It is, throughout the Old Testament, a sign of great disobedience to take a wife from a country like Moab. These were not Christian people, and it almost always ended with the Israelites involved falling away and becoming like the heathens they had married. Um, and I suppose it did end quite badly for the two sons of Naomi, as the very next verse, and Malon and Chilion died also both of them, and the woman were, was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So Naomi, at this point, has lost everything, her husband, her sons, and her status in Israel, because she up and left to Moab when they ran out of food. So since she's going to be a poor widower anyways, she might as well return and do that in her homeland. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Naomi was clearly a mother of some compassion. 
She seemed to have gone on and done okay at the loss of her husband, but she is more or less utterly broken by the loss of her sons. And even though these are merely daughters-in-law, and we all know all the jokes about mothers-in-law and how well they get along with their in-law children, she clearly cares very much for them. They, she doesn't want them to feel obligated by the duties of being family members, that they should go back to their own home, their own culture, and live their own lives. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. I, if I should say, I have hope, if I should have any husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes, and the hand of the Lord, that's the hand of the Lord, is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And I don't really think we should feel bad about Orpah. This is the expected duty of a family member like this, to make the offer to go along with Naomi, but to not have any obligation to go through with moving to a brand new country that you know nothing about, especially in this day and age where travel would be extremely difficult and even countries like Israel were generally less than friendly towards um, foreigners, or perhaps especially Israel. So it would not be expected of anyone to go along with Naomi if they were in Orpah or Ruth's condition, um, situation, I should say. And yet, and, and Ruth said, Behold thy sis, no, and Naomi said, the pronoun game. Thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For wherever thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she, that is Naomi, saw that she, which is Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So Ruth has decided to leave everything behind that she has ever known and go with her mother-in-law because she cares for her so deeply. And Naomi's response is to stop speaking to Ruth. Must have been a very awkward trip. So, they so the two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? So Naomi was a fairly well-known woman that everyone in the city recognizes her, even after ten years of being away. So that fervor supports to me the idea that Elimelech was a man of some importance. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, which means blessed means something similar to blessed. I don't think it was pleasant. pleasant. Thank you. His Bible has better footnotes than mine, I guess. And call me not Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me, ner call, call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So these two single, presumably broke, outcasts of women have returned back to Naomi's homeland just as harvest is beginning. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth. An interesting turn on that phrase. In the Bible, it's usually described as a mighty man of valor. But in this case, it's a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. 
And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So Ruth was not intentionally going out to seek family members. She's new to the area, and she wasn't born and raised here, so she logically wouldn't know who she was related to specifically. It appears to have been mere chance she found herself into the fields of Boaz, which could be quite dangerous in this day and age. As the beginning said, this was the days of the judges, when everyone in Israel did what was right in their own sight. So you could have someone like Elimelech, who ups and leaves to a different country when things get hard. Or you could have someone like Gideon, who is prone to burning down entire towns when he doesn't get his way. Luckily, she was in the field of a man by the name of Boaz. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servants, What was that was sent over the reapers? What damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little, little in the house. So she's been working all day, just as long as the men have, with only one short break. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a, tri a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a place which thou knowest not therefore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, unto whose wings thou art come to trust. So Boaz, I think it is fairly safe to say, was an unusually kind man. And he certainly cared about this specific situation, enough for someone of his status, a great man of wealth, to take notice of a homeless, penniless widower like this. And to do more than just help her out himself personally, but to actively ask for a blessing from the Lord on her, even when she's an absolute stranger from one of Israel's greatest enemies, who, as far as he is aware most likely, doesn't even believe in the same God that the Israelites do. And I think it would be fair to say that Ruth probably didn't at the beginning of this story and was converted by Naomi at some point throughout this, though I don't think we can nail down a specific time for that um, conversion. And Boaz... Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my lord, for thou, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of, of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. But that was a somewhat dangerous move on Boaz's part. Hey, young men of the field, that pretty single lady, go ahead and it is okay to give her extra food. I'm surprised the Bible doesn't mention him coming back and find that she, they have given her entire stacks of the barley she is gathering. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned. And was it, it was about an ephah of barley, which I assume is a lot. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. 
So Ruth had saved some food from the dinner that Boaz had given her and brought it back for her own mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she was. So you kind of see why the horizontal relationships are just as important as the vertical. Naomi shows kindness to Ruth. Ruth shows kindness to Naomi, accompanying her to this brand new world of Israel for her. Boaz shows kindness to Ruth. Ruth shows kindness to Naomi, and Naomi in turn asks for a blessing on Boaz. So really, the solution is not to be Elimelech, more or less, to just run off to some foreign land when things go wrong. Hopefully, if you cultivate those horizontal relationships, if you show love one to another, the, it's called the rule of karma, which is definitely not from biblical sources, but I think it really is a biblical principle that good is returned to those who do good. Eventually, after a fashion maybe, but it will happen if it takes all the way to the afterlife. Uh, that which you sow, so shall you reap. And Naomi's, ah, and Ruth the Moabitess said, he saith unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens and that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz, clean, glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi her mother-in-law said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Good old mother-in-law still has not given up meddling in her daughter-in-law's life. And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast, Behold, he win winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. There is a whole lot in this book and many others throughout the Old Testament that I assume would make a good deal more sense if I understood the culture better. But I think, I think I get the general gist of this, but the exact meaning is most likely lost on me as a modern American. So to summarize a little bit, Ruth does <laughs> as is suggested to her. She attends the party, <coughs> Boaz gets drunk, it's the end of the harvest, he's done very well, the famine is over, everyone has plenty of food, so he parties with his men, passes out by the haystack, Ruth comes and lays on his feet, for whatever reason. Um, he gets spooked in the middle of the night when he realizes there's a strange lady laying on my feet. I wonder if that happens often in this place. <laughs> And so to skip forwards to verse 9, and he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaiden. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. Um, in the translation I have at home, it's made a little clear that she's asking him to take her under his wing for protection. And he said, Blessed be the... Thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou followedest not young men, whether poor or rich. When I first read that, I thought Boaz was saying, hey, you are coming to me for help, and that is kinder than being with your mother-in-law, because I'm old and stuff. But I don't think that was the intended meeting. I think he was saying that you have not been like Oprah. Um, not the television host, her sister, in-law at least, who stayed back home in Moab and presumably went on to marry someone there to chase after a <coughs> young man, rather poor or rich. Uh, poor probably being Israel in this case because it's the day of the judges and they're getting invaded every other week. So you didn't chase after the rich young Moabite men or the poor young Israelite men. You have instead been more concerned with preserving your father-in-law's legacy and helping out Naomi. 
And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. My feet are cold. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. So he doesn't even know if he'll be able to do this very special thing for her, to reestablish her family in Israel. And he's still going to help her out every way he possibly can. He's so unsure of this that he wants her to leave very early in the morning and for anyone who witnesses her leaving to not tell anyone. So he wants to keep this all very hush-hush. And yet he still gives her a bunch of food for absolutely free, which she takes home and gives once again to Naomi. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? Must have been really early in the morning. And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know now how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished this thing this day. This makes me really interested in Boaz's personality and character if Naomi, who has been gone for the last 10 years, and knows that Boaz isn't a super close family relationship, there's at least one guy who is more closely related to them, and she still knows Boaz well enough to say that the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Boaz is determined. This thing is going to be resolved by sundown, one way or another. No wonder he's a mighty man of wealth. Then went Boaz up to the gate, and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. And unto him he said, Ho, oh, such a one. According to my other Bible, this is literally translated as, Hey, so and so. And I just love the casualness of that. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city, and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's. I'm reminded somewhat of the parable of the prodigal son. This person who ran away when things got hard with her husband has returned beyond hope from the dead, seemingly. And though she has lost all her riches, we may be able to do something to restore her for the sake of our brother Elimelech. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. I'm going to give you the first shot. If you want this, you can go ahead and get it. Um, he's advertising it. It's a sales pitch. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Sounds good. I'm, I'm okay with getting some free land out of this. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. So this, I think, gives a little more insight into all of this, why Boaz was impressed Ruth wasn't running after young rich men, because if she was given to a closer family member, her family line will be better established and continue forwards. The one that should have ended with the death of Elimelech and all his sons could still be raised out of the dead. Plus, the wife of the dead is just something really cool to call someone. That is a good name. <laughs> then the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. And I think the translation for that is, if I have to get married to do this, my wife is going to be kind of angry. So that, that's okay. You can have it. 
Now this was the matter in former things in Israel, concerning redeeming and considering changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Okay. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. I appreciate its attempt to explain the culture, um, though it's still a little weird to me. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi, which as far as we can tell at the moment is um, nothing because they were starving and had to more uh, get the leftovers from uh, the farming in order to just survive. But maybe that's just women not being allowed to run businesses in this day and age. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gates and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrath, and be famous in Bethlehem. Hopefully not too similar to Rachel and Leah, as their stories were not 100% happy ones. So Bebez took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he waited unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hast not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine own name, old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. So at the very least, Naomi definitely gets a happy ending out of all of this. She has a daughter-in-law who is better than seven sons and even gets to be a grandmother, which is pretty cool. Now, in our day and age, it doesn't really seem like a big deal that family lines continue, that your last name, your house, as it were, be established and continue on. Um, our society is not that big on uh, cool, uh, legacies anymore, at least not family legacies. But in this case, I must agree with the Old Testament in that this is a very good thing. As we read afterwards, And the women her neighbors gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So because, all the way back in chapter 1, that Ruth loved her mother-in-law enough, she was willing to leave home and gods to come to Israel and become a Jew. Because of that one relatively simple act of kindness, she became the grandmother of Jesse, who is of course the father of David, the greatest king Israel ever had, with the possible exception of Solomon and a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. So what can appear as very simple horizontal, horizontal acts of love and kindness really do work more towards the vertical love as well. The kindness that Christians show one to another is all a big part of God's scheme of love, as it could be called. And I know there was a lot of just plain reading this morning, believe me, I am aware of that. But I think it's important every now and then to go back and cover things thoroughly. There is an issue of sorts with the culture we currently live in in regards to the Bible, in that we are somewhat immune to it, I feel. We are, as a society, moving further and further away from Christianity, but it's still a very big part of our day-to-day -day life. As mom is fond of pointing out, you can't read the comics page on the Sunday funnies half the times without getting numerous references to the Bible every now and then, especially from Peanuts, a personal favorite of mine. But, so it's definitely still there in the society, but it's just enough that it's something of an inoculation 
Um, we were talking about the smallpox vaccine. We've all somewhat become immune to the Christian message, this blindingly amazing idea of something as simple as love. Because um, the most successful evangelical effort, to my knowledge, in the Bible was Jonah. He went to Nineveh, eventually, preached, and the entire city, from the livestock to the king, repented and turned and followed God. Nineveh was not better than Israel. If anything, they were worse than Moab. These were not Christian people in a Christian society. So the message given to them of the God of Israel, I feel a big part of why it was so successful to them, is that they had never heard anything like this before. It was a brand new idea. So it had a weight to it that you don't have when you can open the newspaper and read about God's love in the comics page. Um, it's kind of like reading a book for the very first time. With really good books, I feel the first time will always be the best time. Because after that, you know how it ends. The ending's spoiled to you. You know what this is all building up for. There's no suspense to it. Now, there are some books that you have to read three or four times before you can even understand what happened. But as a general rule, there's nothing like that very first time experiencing a story like that. And I think it's much the same with the Christian message. Um, Amazing Grace tells it very well. How precious was that hour where I first believed. So I do want to take up just a little bit more time to just kind of really nail the message of love down. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and do my best to read and understand this like I've never heard these words before, like I haven't grown up in church and read this chapter every few months for a majority of my life. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tons of men and of angels and have charity and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I could understand any language and speak with the conviction of an angel, if I don't care about anyone, I'm a two-year-old in the back with those symbols just making a lot of noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. I know this from my experience on Wednesday Bible night study. I really wish I could claim to understand some mysteries, much less all of them, to get every single word in the Bible. But if you don't care about anyone, meaningless, nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Martyrdom is meaningless without love being the motivation behind it. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not ha behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Wherever there be tongues, they shall cease. Wherever there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. No matter how accurate your prophecy is, no matter how much you know, no matter how skilled you are with tongues or understanding or anything, you're not going to be here forever. This is a mortal life. You will be gone in just a matter of decades. The only legacy you can actually leave is one of charity. That's the only thing that would be properly remembered long after you're dead. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the, that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. That's why. Because tons and prophecy won't do anything for you in heaven. You can't go up to Jesus and speak to him in tons. That's not going to impress him. But you can have charity in this life, which will be rewarded in that one. Love here carries over to there. That is what we can look forward to in heaven. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
For now we see through glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Remember that whole theme about God numbering the hairs on your head? Someday you're going to know him as well as he knows you. You'll be able to know, have that much of an accurate picture of God's true nature and his love. And apparently it is so impressive, you'll spend eternity seeming about it. And now abide the bedrock of Christianity or any religion or system of belief of any kind. If you don't believe what you're saying, why say it? Hope, a very important element to Christianity. I believe it plays a big role in why we live a serve a living Savior. Jesus' work was done at the cross. What he needed to do was die for our sins. I think he rose again as a symbol to us that there is hope. That yes, this really did work. It's okay guys, I got this and I've come back to you to prove it. But the greatest of even these is charity. 